Welcome back everyone to JFace Games. Uh, today we're talking about Draw Steel. Uh, if you want to follow along on your own computer, I've already gotten the um, sort of write-up on jfacegames.com. But as of now, we're going to do it right here. I'm going to go through the mechanics. I'll give a little bit of my insights. I have not played the playtest yet. This is just reading the playtest, but these are just some thoughts. And <clears throat> we'll see what you think. Also, please like and subscribe if you uh, enjoy this kind of stuff. So, what's the resolution mechanic? Well, nowadays, you do 2d10, and they call this the power roll, and they use it for a couple different things. It's for ability rolls, resistance rolls, and your tests. Tests being sort of like skill checks or just in tests against the environment. You roll 2d10, and what's going to end up happening is you're looking for different ranges, right? The ranges you're looking for are... Um, 2 to 11 is a, they call it a tier 1, 12 to 16 is a tier 2, and 17 plus is a tier 3 result, right? So you're looking for these different three results. If you ever roll a natural 20, it's automatically a tier 3 because there are minuses in the game. Uh, there are different things that are going to give you minuses or pluses. And then finally, uh, this is the only thing that it could be a little tricky when I was reading through it, but they have different, they were talking about different types of tests in the game that you can take. And there are easy, medium, or hard tests. The result from an either easy, medium, or hard test in terms of tiers is different. So easy test, if you get a tier one result, that's considered a failure. If it's a medium test and you get a tier one result, that's considered a failure with consequence. And there's a lot of little variabilities like this. And it's when you're doing a test or a skill check of some sort, they're trying to put in that you can have a fail state of success, a fail with consequence, a success with consequence, a fail with um, reward, success with reward, that kind of thing. And so they build that in, and so you just have to know what kind of test it is in order to know what the sort of um, the, the, the success or fail chance is what's happening, All right? Um, and then finally, there are D6s and D3s that are utilized in resolution uh, resolutions, and you always round down. All right, let's get into the actual sort of like character creation part. I'm getting excited. I got to get in that chair. Uh, this is the part I really enjoyed. And they have a step-by-step -step process. And unfortunately, my character design, how I laid it out in my normal format, doesn't take in that sort of process, the steps they have. But we'll, we'll go in this order. So you've got a ton of ancestries. And they call them ancestries in this game. You've got Devil, Dragon Knight, Dwarf, Elf Wode, Elf High. And I don't even know what a Hakan is or a Mimenek. Or a polder is but these all fit into uh matt colville's world <clears throat> and he's got these really awesome sort of like third person narrative write-ups of a type of like if, if it's a the devil the first section of the playtest is a huge write-up um from like a devil's perspective it's trying to infuse that what's the characteristics of the culture of this ancestry right to begin with there's a lot of variability in sort of what these ancestors do so Every ancestry gives you some sort of features or bonuses or something, but they're very different. So like humans get a lot of like um, extra recoveries and resistances, so they're more durable. Um, devils, you customize the appearance, so it's like, I want horns and I want wings. And when, depending on what I take, I, it's a point buy system. And depending on what I take, depends on what bonuses or features or abilities I get. And then you have orcs, which I think had two different thematic combat actions. And so... Every one of these ancestries has it works very differently, and that that's very interesting and that's very on brand. Everything in this game, um, it all should be quote unquote balanced because I know they're play testing and it's very tactical, but um, it's very interesting in terms of like how they're kind of designing these things to make them asymmetrical in nature. That you can kind of just as you pick and choose things, it's a very different experience. <clears throat> Attributes. You have the, there's five different attributes, might, agility, reason, intuition, and presence. And they have a really interesting sort of concept when you're creating your character because minus five to plus five is the range. Um, for the most part, you're going to be sitting around plus two or minus two, but this is the range and you add that to your power roll. So depending on, they call them characteristics as well. Uh, depending on the what you're rolling for, if it's like a uh, strength attack or might attack, then that means you're going to be rolling your 2d10 plus two if you're really good at might to adjust that and hopefully you're getting into one of those tier ranges 
But what they do, which is interesting, and, and we'll talk about this when you choose your class, but your class is going to determine some of your attributes. All right. Skills. I really like this idea. This is a very simple idea that I really like. And that's the idea that you put these skills into skill groups. So they have five skill groups, crafting, exploration, in, interpersonal intrigue, and lore. And then within those five skill groups, you have a host of skills. But now it makes it so that skills aren't overwhelming because they're in these groups. They're not, I don't think they're, they're not all on your character sheet. And you have this, um, this idea that you have a background, say so it's like, I don't know if this is a background, but it's urchin, right? If you have street urchin, well then maybe that street urchin gives you choose one skill from um, exploration, right? And so now you can, it's tailored towards exploration, but you get to choose what skill in particular that you got during exploration. So that's nice. I, I really like that idea. Um, when it comes to your skill checks, the nice thing is there's no, if you have this skill, it adds this and then adds that and there's all this. No, it's just if you have the skill, you get plus two in addition to everything else. So now when I do a skill check, so you, oh, you have to climb that thing. All right, well, I'm going to have to have, um, that's a might. That's the characteristic I'm using for that is might, just based on maybe the way I describe it. I don't know. And then I have a um, exploration skill in climbing. So that means that I'm going to roll 2d10 plus my might score plus two, right? Straight up. Classes, this is a picture by, ooh, Gil, I, I apologize, Gilam Bonnet, but I always loved this photo. I remember when it came out on Twitter a long time back. These are these characteristics, sort of, this is not the actual MCDM characters. They're just sort of like caricatures, and I love it. They've got a host of interesting characters, right? Tactician, which is sort of your leader, shadow, elementalist, mage, beast heart, sensor, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go through all of them. The playtest only has a couple. The playtest has the tactician, who's like the fighter leader, has the shadow, which is like the rogue assassin. -y. The elementalist obviously uses elemental magics. Um, it has the uh, Fury, which is sort of like your Berserker Barbarian. And then I think that it had the Mage. Um, I believe that's the other one that it had. No, uh, yes, I think it had the Mage. It's your caster. No, no, it didn't. It had the Conduit. The Conduit, which is like your Cleric. So those are the ones that it had. Oh, here it is. Duh. Conduit, Fury, Tactician, Elementus, and Shadow. Now, what it did, which there's a, there's a couple things that it did. First off, uh, what it does is that it... It sets in that when you take this class, these two attributes are plus two, and then your other three attributes are an array that you can choose from, right? And there's like three different arrays. And I think that's smart because it makes sure that you're not gimping yourself in a highly tactical game. It's a highly tactical game, and if you're like, I'm a censor, but I'm gonna go all might, and it's like, nah, that's not gonna work in this game. That's not how it's designed. Um, that might work in other games, but not in this one. So it makes sure that you're not allowed to gimp yourself. Uh, you then have a bunch of resources. You've got your stamina, which is like your health. You have recoveries, which are kind of like hit dice uh, in a way as a resource pool. You have your heroic resource, which every class in this game has a different meta currency that it's managing in order to use its abilities and powers. And then finally, you have your abilities and powers. So as an example of resources, you have uh, the fury, which is like the barbarian has rage. The conduit has piety, the elementals have essence, the shadow has insight, and the tactician has focus. What I think is interesting is that how not only each one of these classes plays differently with their heroic resource, but they might gain their heroic resource differently as well. The fury, it's almost randomized. You, you get a d3 per round. The conduit gets plus two, but it can get more if it prays. It uses an ability for prayer. Um, the elementals, shadow, the tactician all just get two around, but... The shadow gets an extra one if it gets a tier three result on someone, and the tactician gets an extra one if it allows an ally to get a tier three um, result on someone that it has marked, that it has targeted, right? So there's a couple other ways to gain heroic resource. Very cool, right? It's leaning into a play style that it wants you to sort of like have with those characters. So that's classes. Backgrounds. Backgrounds is a combination of things. You have culture and you have career. And these are really cool. I, I really like these. Culture kind of reminded me of Daggerheart, how Daggerheart has the two cards that you're adding together, which is like um, urban, like a, it's like a setting, and then a, um, in essence, organization, which is what they call it here. But for your culture, you're going to choose one of three things, your environment, 
right? Rural, nomadic, secluded, urban, etc. Organization, is it anarchic? I guess that's a sort of uh, a bureaucratic or communal. And then what's your particular upbringing, academic, creative, illegal? Each one of these three things, depending on which one you choose, gives you skills, gives you or, or at least access to a skill group, right? So there's a lot of flavor there, depending on which ones you choose. Also, you can really feel what that's building out in terms of the uh, place you grew up. Your career uh, defines the actual profession you had, and it's going to add in skills, language, and it, another thing called your renown score, which I didn't really dig into the renown. I'll, I'll, I'll give a little uh, thing at the end, but uh, it gives you your renown score. Um, some of the different careers are artisan, criminal, gladiator, laborer, mage, apprentice, performer, sage, and soldier. Whew. But what was really nice is each one of these had a table that was the inciting incident, which means that you can roll on this with the D3, and you can kind of get an idea of what it was that moved me from my career to my class and now that I'm an adventurer. And it gives you little prompts that can help you, um, sort of almost like um, archetypes, right? Or like uh, uh, cliche, I don't wanna say cliches, but they're cliches for a reason, like, you know, that kind of thing. Movie tropes, maybe that's the best sort of way of saying it, is tropes. Then you can choose, you can opt for a, a complication. The complication is, um, there's a couple of different options, but in essence, they give you something um, negative, but they give you something positive. Um, some of the examples here is you were a cult victim or your primordial sickness that you have. And so it just gives you that extra flavor, right? Maybe you want to have like a, um, a wrestling major type character from Dragonlance. And so you want to have some sort of curse on you, but you're a little bit more powerful. That's the vibe you're going for. Finally, every class has a ton, ton, ton of abilities. This game is very tactical and the abilities really um, shine and, and have some interesting concepts. And I believe there was some flexibility in terms of like paths or abilities you're choosing within the it's pseudo subclasses for some of them, not others, but you can choose, pick and choose certain powers, but you always have these sort of keystone features that are important. Um, this is just an example of one looks what one looks like. This is the conduit signature. And so this shows you the power roll. And once again, this is a beta. This is a packet. I'm sure that this will be a, a different layout for the actual print, like a little bit more graph-like or cleaner. But for the play test, this is very nice to read, very easy. Gives you a range, how many creatures, what type of action is it, and then um, what are my tiers, right? Equipment. This is the first game I've seen use kits. Um, I think it's really clever. It's clever conceptually, but the idea being that um, you have all these different kits, martial and caster kits in the game, and they are supposed to take on different play style archetypes or tropes that are commonly found, right? The cloak and dagger, the martial artist, the ranger, the mountain, mountain sort of the big durable brute, the sniper, etc. Like these different tropes, like, hey, you want to be a big dude in armor with a shield? This is what you be. You want to be a, a, a duelist with a rapier who's dancing around? This is what you be. This is the kit you put on, and the kit is in essence sort of like your armor and your equipment, etc. And what happens is they have 22 kits in the game currently, and the kit ends up giving you, um, this is a, a table from that, that gives you this sort of array, like when I have this kit, this is the type of armor I have. I can choose thematically what that looks like, but this is the type of armor I have. This is the type of weapon I have. This is how much more stamina I get, so it gives me extra hit points. This is how much faster I am, this, the, et cetera, these kind of things. Um, it's really cool, and you know, and what they talk about is the increase in stamina, the health. As they said, well, when we do the math, armor is either going to take away damage that you would um, sustain, or let's just give you more health because it's mathematically the same thing, and it's easier potentially for the player to just say, okay, I get this much more stamina. So I think that's a nice. I think some people might feel that breaks for uh, very similitude I can never say that word um, that it's not thematically accurate but I don't know I think it's fine I think it's I think it's cool uh, advancements in experience so how do you advance in this game in essence it's something called victories which is like XP in a way but they're encounter based so you complete an encounter um, or in an encounter can be a um, social encounter a combat encounter whatever and in essence you're going to get a victory point for completing that maybe two but I think for the most part it's one 
And these build up, and it's an interesting resource we'll get into in a second, but at some point in time when you take a respite, which is a 24-hour rest, you can cash these in and you cash them in to then buy powers, right? You can do milestones in this game, but I think the victories is the way to go because I, I think they're pretty straightforward and they add some really interesting... You want to lean into them, I think. All right, let's get into combat. When you're figuring out initiative, the first question you have is, is someone surprised or not? Um, people that are surprised, they don't go, or they, they, they go in the first round, but they have a lot of debuffs on them. But what you're going to do is you're going to take a D6, you roll it, or D10, sorry, a D10, if you roll it in the six or higher, the players go first, five or lower, the enemies are going to go first. And what that means is they get to choose who is going first because it's an alternating side initiative. So if the heroes get to go first, someone says, oh, I, I have an idea, I'm going to do this, they do it. And then the GM gets to choose, or they call it in this, the director gets to choose a monster who then gets to go. So someone on his side, and then it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. If you're surprised, you have a lot of different sort of debuffs, right? And this might be tricky for people to remember at first. I'm sure there's, it, I'm sure it gets easier, like all these type of tactical games. There's a lot of information up front, but after you've played it a couple of times, it becomes second nature. But in essence, you're going to get debuffed. If you are surprised, people have an easier time hitting you. You have a harder time uh, resisting things, and you don't have a trigger action. Okay, that's not too bad, right? The only thing that I didn't understand language-wise here is that you have these things called minions who, that are in squads, and you have monsters that are in groups. And it specifically said in the playtest that the GM organizes monsters in groups, and that when the, the director is deciding who's going they get to have all monsters in a group go together. And I, and I didn't find the information about how to create groups, but in essence, your rogue goes or your shadow goes and the director gets to choose what's going and he could choose all the minions in one squad or he can have all these monsters in this group go. So it's not just one, 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 one. There's a little bit of variability there in terms of that. And I'm sure that's because certain groups together equal one um, hero and so they can go uh, together once everyone's gone that's a round and then you get into action economy action economy you get a move a maneuver and a action right and then you get a triggered action once around which is very synonymous to a reaction your movement is going to be whatever your speed is and that's going to be determined also by your kit it's going to adjust by your kit and if you decide to shift you get to move half your movement but you're not going to provoke any opportunity attacks. Maneuvers, um, I kind of wrote it down as it's the quick things you want to do, but they shouldn't be free because of what they, um, how much time they actually probably take. So this is helping someone, drinking a potion, escaping, grabbing, hiding, knocking back, etc. Those kind of things that it's not a, it shouldn't be a free action, meaning I'm going to open this door, but it, 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 so it needs to take a little bit more time or at least a choice. And then you have your actions, which primarily you're going to be doing your ability, uh, your abilities from your class. But you could try to catch your breath, which is you get to use one of your recoveries. You might try to defend, which means that everyone gets a double bane against you. Um, or you might have a free strike, which is sort of like your opportunity attacks. And uh, well, no, free strike was something else. Um, free strike is is just a, a normal attack. It's not using an ability. So you're the fury. You're really good at melee. There's a guy way off in the distance. You have a bow and arrow. You're like, all right, I guess I'm going to attack it. You just use a basic attack, which is sort of like a free strike. The attack mechanics, very simple. 2d10 plus your attribute. So might if you're melee or potentially agility. And then you're going to add an edge or a bane, depending on if that's an effect currently that's happening. Right? Super simple. Then you just check the results table. Was it how much damage did I do, etc. Defensively, the monsters utilize power rolls just the same, so they're going to roll their power roll, and they're going to deal damage to your stamina. Um, there are different triggers that might be uh, triggers or abilities that maybe allow you to reduce that damage. So otherwise, you're just going to be taking stamina. I think that stamina is going to be getting dropped constantly doo -doo 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 on both sides, and it's probably a pretty bloody game in that sense. Monsters are also organized into these awesome little um, subgroups that I love from Fourth Edition, and they added more that I didn't think about but they have brutes artillery controllers those are very minions those are very fourth edition but then they have ambush ambusher harriers hexers and more and this is a little layout of what that looks like right of what a monster might look like 
reaction rolls are your saving throws in essence. Um, these are very triggered in particular. Hidden monsters, motives, environmental effects, etc., are going to cause reactions. And then we finally have modifications, right? So the different ways you can modify a roll, the big one is edges and banes, right? So we already know you have pluses, skills, and uh, characteristics, but you also have edges and banes. This takes a second to, to compute, but in essence, an edge is a positive plus two, a bane is a negative two um, to your power roll, okay? Simple. That is if you have a single edge or a single bane. A single edge and a single bane counteract each other. If I've got one single edge, or if I've got a single edge and a single bane, that means I just roll plus zero. Now, if you have more than one edge from different bonuses, it's considered a double edge. Doesn't matter how many more you have. If I have five edges, that is considered a double edge. If I have more than one bane, that's considered a double bane. If I have five banes, it's a double bane. Whenever you have a double edge, what that does is instead of giving you plus four, it gives you one tier higher. So if my result was a tier one, it becomes a tier two. Same with a bane. If I have double bane, if my result was a tier two, it becomes a tier one. Now, here's where you combine them and it becomes a little interesting. If I have a double edge and one bane, this just becomes a single edge. If I have a double edge and a double bane, they cancel each other. And that means that I could have nine edges and two banes, but they're both considered double edge and double bane, which means that the result is no bonuses, no nothing, right? So that just takes a quick second, and hopefully that wasn't, uh, you can read this, hopefully it wasn't convoluted, but I think it's actually pretty intuitive once you get used to just saying those terms and realizing that double doesn't necessarily mean two of, it, it's almost like multiple, right? It's, it's almost like a plurality. The other thing you can do is you can assist someone. If you assist someone, you make a test, and depending on your results, you're either going to give that person an edge, a bane, or a double. It's either going to be a bane, an edge, or a double edge, depending on what you roll in the power roll, right? So if I get a, a what is it, an 11 or less, I just gave them a bane. Sorry. If it's uh, 11 to 17, I gave them an edge, and if it's a 17 plus, I gave them a double, a double edge. And I'm probably adding my characteristics to that or my skill or whatever the case might be in order to boost that up. Uh, there's a bunch of conditions. It's not a ton, which I thought was fascinating. I thought I thought for sure I was going to get into the condition section. It was going to be massive. It's not too bad, right? It's, it's a very uh, small condition system, which I think was really nice. Uh, rest mechanic is you have a respite. They're very specific, particular. You has to be 24 hours uninterrupted to have a respite. Um, during this time, you can cash in your victories for XP to gain stuff. You can change your kit here. You can't change your kit otherwise. Um, so your equipment. And then you get all your recoveries back, right? So let's get into these action pools. I already talked about the heroic resource. That's the biggest thing, right? And I, I don't need to go into more detail on that, but that's what your class gives you. Victories is also a pseudo action pool. That What happens is as you are playing, you are burning recoveries. So you're losing this resource that's going to help you... Um, it's going to help you uh, heal, but you're building victories after every encounter. Victories, what they do is they act as a, a bonus of sorts. So whenever I start a fight as a tactician, yes, I'm trying to build up my focus, which is my main meta currency, but I start the fight with a certain amount of focus based on how many victories we have, right? And there's other things that victories, I think the more victories you have, the more things they unlock, like they might unlock extra stamina, they might unlock extra, etc. So you're becoming more powerful so to speak, as you continue to push through encounters, but you're probably losing out on your ability to heal yourself and your wounds. So it's a risk reward. And I think it's a really interesting press luck mechanic. I can't wait to test it. Right? I, can't, I can't wait to test it out. When it comes to health and dying, you have your stamina. When your stamina hits zero, you are now considered um, dying. You're considered dying. And that's an important keyword, right? So we already know that you have recoveries, and recoveries are like hero dice or hit dice, where different abilities or different powers or different actions are going to allow you to tap into use your recovery. When you use your recovery, it's there's a specific recovery value that you get back in your stamina, and that's based on your class and stuff. And so once you've run out of uh, recoveries, you better take a respite or else you're not going to have any more access to that. <clears throat> hero tokens are another way of getting your recovery value. 
These are in essence like inspiration tokens, but specifically for turning in to gain hit points back. So that's kind of neat and interesting. Here's the winded, winded and dying. So you have a winded value. It's another term, I know. But a winded value is half your stamina, and it's on your character sheet. And it just sits there. It doesn't. It might be a trigger for certain abilities or tactics or things like that. But as of now, in my understanding, is it's just an ability. Like I'm sure the fury when you're when you are winded, you do more stuff. That just makes sense thematically. But we already talked about if your stamina hits zero, you're dying. You're still up and fighting, right? But you have these conditions. While you're dying, anytime you make an attack. Anytime you make a test with might or agility, anytime you try to take a triggered action, you roll a d6 and you lose that much more stamina. So you're going into negatives. Also, you can't catch your breath. So you can't heal yourself when you're dying, but other people can heal you, right? Or at least you can't take the catch your breath action. Maybe if you're a conduit, you can cast a heal if there is one. If you ever get to negative your winded score, so if, say I have 32 stamina, so I have 16, so my 16 is my winded score. If I ever get to negative 16, I am now officially dead. And so that's the dying mechanic. Interesting. Then finally, I just want to throw this in there because there's a ton of stuff. There's no real magic system. Everything's like an ability, right? And so it's not like there's a separate magic system. But there's a ton of GM. There's a there's just a ton. This game is very loaded with things like you have group tests, montage tests, you have hide and seek rules, you have renown and followers, you have wealth rankings, you have different um, rules for flanking, concealment, cover. There is a massive negotiation mechanic, right? So how does that look? And you have even rules for mounted combat. And this is all the in the in the um, play test that you have all these extra rules. And I don't mean extra rules, I mean specific rules, specific, specific situations that you want to be able to play out, right? So that is the draw steel rule set so far that uh, in the play test of me breaking that down. Hopefully that was informative to you. I can't wait to try it out because I do like tactical games. Um, so I can't wait to try it out and see what it looks like. All right, guys, uh, hit the bell, hit the subscribe, and I'll see you next time.